Among the monsters said to roam the world's jungles and desolate deserts, none is more feared than the chupacabra, the blood-sucking beast blamed for the mysterious deaths of thousands of animals since the 1990s. Originating in Latin America, yet known worldwide, the chupacabra is a blend of vampire and shapeshifter, changing its appearance and characteristics depending on when and where it's seen. Hi, I'm Ben Radford. I'm an investigator with the Committee for Skeptical Inquiry, co-host of the Monster Talk podcast, and author of five books. I scientifically investigate mysterious and paranormal claims, including those about ghosts, UFOs, and monsters. I've spent much of the past five years investigating the vampire beast El Chupacabra, and I believe I've finally solved the mystery. My research into the Chupacabra took me from dusty Texas towns to humid Central American jungles, from sunny Caribbean islands to harshly lit library archives. I've appeared on various TV shows discussing the beast, including National Geographic's Is It Real series and the History Channel's Monster Quest. Here, specially prepared for mailbox black operatives and audiences, is a sneak preview of my book, Tracking the Chupacabra, the Vampire Beast in Fact, Fiction, and Folklore. Chapter 1, The Goat Sucker Mystery Among the monsters said to roam the world's desolate deserts and dense jungles, perhaps none is more feared than the bloodthirsty Chupacabra. Rooted in conspiracy theory and anti-American sentiment, the Chupacabra is a contradictory and bizarre amalgamation of vampiric monster, folk myth, and chameleon. It's a shapeshifter, changing its appearance and characteristics according to the time and place it's seen, and according to the beliefs and expectations of those who see it. Bigfoot, the mysterious bipedal beast said to roam North America's wilderness, is named after what it leaves behind, Bigfoot Prince. Bigfoot's Hispanic cousin, the Chupacabra, is also known less for what it is than what it leaves behind, dead animals. Though goats are said to be its favorite prey, Chupacabra means goat sucker in Spanish, it's also been blamed for attacks on cats, sheep, rabbits, dogs, chickens, hogs, and other animals. Descriptions of the Chupacabra vary widely, but many accounts suggest that the creature stands about four to five feet tall. It has short but powerful legs that allow it to leap fantastic distances long claws, and terrifying black or glowing red eyes. Some claim it has spikes down the back. Others report seeing stubby, bat-like wings. Some say the stench of sulfur taints the air around the chupacabra, or that it emits a terrifying hiss when threatened. While some mistakenly believe that the chupacabra sightings date back to the 1970s or earlier, the chupacabra first gained real notoriety in 1995 in Puerto Rico. No one knew for certain why or how the chupacabra seemingly suddenly sprang into existence, but many Latin Americans believe it's the unholy creation of secret U.S. government experiments in the jungles of Puerto Rico. It had a heyday of about five years when it was widely reported in Mexico, Chile, Nicaragua, Spain, Argentina, Brazil, and Florida, among other places. The chupacabra can be categorized as appearing in three different physical forms and countless cultural ones. The original, and best known, is that of a five-foot-tall bipedal creature with long claws and a distinctive row of spikes down its back, reported in August 1995 by Puerto Rican eyewitness Madeline Tolentino. The second form is a mammal from the Canidae family, a small, four-legged beast looking very much like a dog or coyote. The third is a sort of catch-all category that basically includes any unusual animal, alive or dead, that really anybody reports seeing or thinks for whatever reason might possibly be the dreaded chupacabra. Whatever form it takes, in 15 years it has become a global phenomenon, the world's third best-known monster after Bigfoot and Nessie. In 2002, a writer for 40 in Times magazine noted that, quote, not since the advent of crop circles has a strange phenomena been so quickly assimilated into popular culture. Chupacabras is now equal to the Loch Ness Monster or Bigfoot as a cultural icon, end quote. Some researchers, such as Lauren Coleman and Scott Corrales, suggest that the name Chupacabra dates back to 1960, when a character on the TV western show Bonanza referred to a Chupacabras. It seems that this reference was to a whippoorwill bird, which folklore suggested drank milk, not blood, from goats. Other than the shared name, however, there's no connection between the insect-eating bird and the Hispanic vampire beast El Chupacabra. As Coleman notes, quote, The vampire element appears to be a recent addition to the folkloric aspects of these tales, end quote. Also, a goat sucker is referred to in the writings of Aristotle, 
though surely the Greek philosopher was not referring to the subject of this book. For a creature as well known as the chupacabra, it's been the subject of remarkably little serious research. Information on the beast is fragmentary, often poorly sourced, and contradictory. In the world of the chupacabra, proven facts and wild speculations mix freely and indistinguishably. Researcher Carl Schuker lamented the, quote, immense confusion and contradiction, end quote, surrounding the chupacabra, making it almost impossible to distinguish fact from fiction and reality from hearsay and folklore about the creature. The chupacabra has, of course, made its way into various books on unexplained mysteries. While a few authors write with some scholarship and authority on the chupacabra, the vast majority of information on the subject is rife with error, mistaken assumption, and misinformation. Often this misinformation is because authors, instead of doing the heavy lifting of any actual investigation, fact-checking, or research, will simply copy liberally from other authors and other sources, often embellishing or inventing facts along the way to spice up the story. When it comes to descriptions of the goat sucker, authors arbitrarily pick and choose which details they want to use to create their chimeric chupacabra. Hayden Blackman, for example, in his Field Guide to North American Monsters, states that, quote, the typical chupacabra is covered in glossy matted hair and has a feral face. Its long limbs, which end in massive claws, can propel the monster across any terrain at amazing speeds. But it's the creature's powerful bat-like wings that allow it to migrate huge distances. Goat suckers are deceptively small, standing just three to four feet high, end quote. George Eberhardt's Mysterious Creatures, A Guide to Cryptozoology, offers another description. Height, four to five feet covered in short gray fur, said to have a chameleon-like ability to change color. Large, round head, huge, lidless, fiery red eyes run up the temples and round the sides. Ears, small or absent, two small nostrils, lipless mouth, sharp, protruding fangs. Pointy spikes run from the head down to the spine. These may double as wings. Thin arms with three webbed fingers. Muscular but thin hind legs. Three clawed toes, no tail, end quote. Lauren Coleman's Field Guide to Bigfoot, Yeti, and Other Mystery Primates Worldwide draws from the same chief eyewitnesses and offer a similar description, but suggests that the creature might be a type of freshwater mare being, related to possibly mermaids. The book A Natural History of Unnatural World states that the chupacabra is, quote, a strange two-legged creature, about four to five feet high, which looks like a cross between an alien and a fanged kangaroo. It has sharp spikes down its back, a powerful tail, and staring red eyes and big ears and needle-like teeth for the blood-sucking, end quote. Not to be outdone, Giles Sparrow's Field Guide to Fantastic Creatures describes it as, quote, a strange reptilian beast with a kangaroo-like gait, glowing red eyes, and a row of sharp spikes running along its back, end quote. From the sample, we can see that, depending on which book you're reading or whose eyewitness account you believe, the chupacabra either has a powerful tail or it has no tail at all. It either spends most of its time flying in the night skies, or it doesn't, lacking wings. It might have three fingers on each hand, or four. It might have a row of distinctive spikes on its back, or it might not. Its ears are either big, or they're small or absent. About the only detail these accounts have in common is the pair of red eyes. Amazingly, many writers claim that the descriptions are actually very similar. If these summaries of the chupacabra characteristics are confusing and contradictory, the original eyewitness descriptions, presented in later chapters, are even worse. The huge disparity in Chupacabra reports is one of the things that Lauren Coleman finds most fascinating. Quote, It's intriguing that a relatively small number of sightings of an upright, gray, spiky-haired primate in Puerto Rico morphed into a widespread misidentification of four-legged, usually black and brown dogs, foxes, coyotes, and other canids, with or without mange, living or dead, as Chupacabras, he said. But now we're getting ahead of the story. Let's begin at the beginning in Puerto Rico. The Puerto Rican chupacabra panic began in 1995 when residents in the small town of Orocovis and Morovis discovered farm animals that had apparently been drained of blood through small puncture wounds. Similar mysterious mutilations and desanguinations occurred occasionally around the island, but the creature or creatures responsible were rarely sighted. It seemed the elusive vampire somehow always managed to do their dirty work away from prying eyes. Puerto Rican comedian Silvio Perez claimed that he coined the name Chupacabra shortly after the first attacks became public, 
Though others dispute this claim, Jonathan Downs, for example, claims that his friend Ismael Guayo came up with the moniker. Regardless of who named it, the act of labeling the chupacabra in a very real way created the creature. The idea that something was attacking animals in Puerto Rico was not new. But the one-word label gave it a name, a currency, and a credibility. And soon dozens of eyewitnesses would give it dozens of different chaotic forms. About five months would pass before the first person actually caught a glimpse of the blood beast in Canovanus, about 20 minutes east of the capital of San Juan. In fact, that eyewitness sighting provided much more than a glimpse. It was an incredibly thorough and detailed description of what would eventually become the world-famous Chupacabra. This sighting, in turn, spurred further reports and sightings. The tabloids and news media pounced on each new report as if, were, as if it were catnip, eager to warn audiences about this novel bloodthirsty menace with sensational stories. It's against this background that the Puerto Rican Chupacabra came into its own. Scott Corrales' 1997 book, Chupacabras and Other Mysteries, provides a fascinating glimpse into the origins of the Chupacabra phenomena in Puerto Rico. Of particular interest are the eyewitness descriptions and the public's reactions to the creature. The book, Chupacabras and Other Mysteries, lists dozens and dozens of eyewitness reports and sightings. Here's a sample. The thing was generally humanoid in appearance, three to four feet tall, and had orange-yellow eyes. A round-headed creature with elongated black eyes, a fine jaw, and a small mouth, with chameleon-like pigmentation, alternating from purple to brown to yellow, while its face was a dark grain color, a gargoyle-esque creature. A creature between three and four feet tall, with a body and dense black plumage of an eagle, a thick neck, piercing eyes, and a wolf-like muzzle instead of a beak. A creature four feet tall that walked on two legs with elongated red eyes, large fangs, claw-like hands, and a dark gray body. Yet, other eyewitnesses described a creature with pointed ears, a strange profile, and a shaven head that ran like a gazelle. An animal three feet tall with a crest on its back, large wings, and three-fingered hands. And then there's a monster about 30 inches tall, weighing 66 pounds, and having ashen dark feathers and sizable wings. How this eyewitness could provide such exacting height and weight measurements for the beast is something of a mystery in itself. One writer, Mark Davenport, stated that, quote, Several witnesses swore that the goat sucker's eyes emitted beams of light that eliminated the nocturnal landscape like flashlight beams. Many who saw the chupacabra said it had a, a web of skin that connects its wrist to its knee or ankle, and this formed a wing like that of a flying squirrel when it raises its arms, and that this structure allows it to glide like a hang glider. But some witnesses insisted that the chupacabra has levitation capability that allows it to float through the air like Superman. One witness claimed that the extremely rapid movement of small, feather-like appendages along its backbone propelled it like a bumblebee. At least one writer suggested that the chupacabra had language skills and could understand spoken Spanish, including profanities, as seen in this description of an eyewitness's encounter. Quote, the housewife's eyes met those of the inhuman creature and stared it down as she thought aloud, If you're a chupacabras, you're a pretty sorry excuse for the creature. Then promptly added the abusive word, pendejo, to her thought. The gargoyle-esque creature slowly covered its pointed face with its wings, as if hurt by her rebuff. It moved away from its position and slinked against the wall and half hid behind a washing machine. End quote. Almost as bizarre as the reports of the chupacabra's visage were reports of its actions. A farmer named Rafael Moreno claimed that the chupacabra had taken sexual liberties with his cows. Lorne Coleman, in his 2003 book Bigfoot, included reports of Bigfoot raping cows as well. Some Puerto Ricans, borrowing from werewolf mythology, believed that only silver bullets would stop the chupacabra. And several Puerto Rican UFO groups claimed that the creature was the source of the AIDS epidemic. One group put forth the theory that the chupacabra was, quote, one of 20 or more beings that had descended to Earth to conduct experiments with human blood in order to produce blood viruses aimed at eliminating humanity. This effort was supposed to depopulate the Earth, leaving it open for alien colonization, end quote. Wild speculation ran rampant throughout Puerto Rico at the height of the chupacabra hysteria. Many of the rumors and stories about the chupacabra were so wild that almost any story, no matter how outlandish, unfounded, or clearly wrong, would gain credence with somebody somewhere. 
This social climate of few facts and sensationalist tabloid headlines combined with wild rumor and gossip to create the perfect breeding ground for a mild form of mass hysteria in which ordinary events such as attacks by dogs on pets were interpreted in extraordinary way. Emerging from out of this confused welter of reports and vampire scares was the best chupacabra sighting in history from a woman named Madeline Tolentino. It's the most important chupacabra sighting on record, not only because of its detail, but also because it is the original chupacabra description upon which the most famous depictions of the creature are based. Tolentino said that the chupacabra she saw had dark eyes that went up to the temples and spread around the sides. It was about four to five feet tall, walked on two legs, and had thin arms and legs with three fingers and toes at the end of each limb. It had no ears or nose, but instead two small air holes. She also noted what appeared to be feathers, spikes, or feathery spikes on the creature's back. Much more on this topic later. Though the chupacabra had its heyday in the last half of 1995 and early 1996, the beast soon spread from its Puerto Rican home looking for more goats to suck in the greener pastures of the mainland. As news reports of the chupacabra spread, so did the reported sightings of the creature. In March 1996, Spanish-language talk show Cristina aired a story about the goat sucker, followed almost immediately by an increase in reports from Mexico and Spanish-speaking areas of the United States. The chupacabra was reported in a dozen or so other countries, all of them, quite significantly, Spanish-speaking or Portuguese-speaking areas. A complete accounting of every single report would be both tedious and repetitive, but I'll highlight some of the better-known, representative, and more revealing chupacabra reports outside of Puerto Rico after 1995. A close analysis of these reports reveals that the majority of them, though widely claimed to be reports of the chupacabra and cited as evidence for them, in fact have no sighting of the goat sucker at all. Instead, they're merely reports of animals mysteriously drained of blood and assumed to have been attacked by the beast. As we'll see, there's not necessarily a cause and effect link. In north and central Mexico, especially in the state of Jalisco, sheep and goats were said to have been attacked by the chupacabra in May 1996. According to an Associated Press report, quote, the dead animals all reportedly have two tooth marks about a third of an inch across in the neck and appear to have been drained of blood. Rumors of the attacks on livestock are roaring through Jalisco, despite official doubt and denial heaped upon them. Francisco Rodriguez Herrion, director of the Guadalajara Zoo, took a cast of the paw print and said that it looked like that of a dog or large wolf, end quote. In March 2008, the chupacabra reappeared in the Champaton municipality. Eight hens and a turkey were killed when something, quote, arrived and sucked the blood from them and later escaped without leaving a sign, end quote. Though nobody got a look at whatever attacked the animals, neighbors said that it must have been the chupacabra because the attack to the fowl had the same characteristics of when, some years ago, animal slaughters were reported in other parts of the country. The dead hens caused a panic among Champaton residents, who brought their livestock into their homes for protection and formed an armed mob to hunt down the goat sucker. A brigade crossed the streets by night, armed with poles and machetes, to catch or kill the assumed chupacabra. Nothing was ever found. The chupacabra apparently traveled to the northern Chilean city of Calama in April 2000, where unverified reports said that as many as 300 animals were all found dead, at least some of them drained of blood. No one saw the attacks, but residents said they, they heard terrifying sounds in the night's darkness and were afraid to investigate until the next morning. Police searched the area, finding nothing but footprints. In June, the investigation concluded that the animals were killed by feral dogs. Many in the public were skeptical of this explanation and smelled, if not the stench of a chupacabra, at least a government cover-up. Following the official report about the Kalama predation, newspapers ran articles by prominent Chilean UFO researchers who claimed that the military had found three chupacabra eggs in Chile's northern Atacama Desert and, through top-secret clandestine genetics experiments, in collaboration with the U.S. government, of course, had hatched new chupacabras. Indeed, quote, the chupacabra material was then turned over to NASA, according to Chilean press accounts. Radio programs in Chile have also accused the American Space Agency of creating the chupacabra in the lab in the first place while conducting genetics experiments in the Chilean desert, end quote. In another variation of the story, quote, Chilean soldiers had captured a chupacabra male, female, and cub that had been living in a mine north of Calama. Then, according to the account, 
a team of NASA scientists arrived in a black helicopter, what else, and reclaimed the Chupacabra family. The Chupacabras, so the story claimed, had escaped from a top-secret NASA facility in the Atacama Desert, where the space agency was attempting to create some sort of hybrid beings that could survive on Mars. Then there's the report that a miner in the town of Huasco had captured a chupacabra that resembled, quote, a kangaroo with wings. The beast, Chilean newspaper Las Ultimas Noticias reported in November 2001, had escaped the miner's captivity, but had flown to a nearby mine where police had the goat sucker cornered. Perhaps not surprisingly, no further details were forthcoming. These examples, and many others, illustrate the dangers in taking chupacabra reports at face value even those not published in sensationalized tabloid newspapers. Proponents of the Chupacabra's existence like to cite laundry lists of sightings and news reports about the goat sucker as if the sheer quantity of them amounted to irrefutable evidence. Yet, almost invariably, most of the reports are either one, patently fictional, or two, so heavily sensationalized that there's no way to know what might have been actually cited, or three, Sightings of some odd animal or monster that has nothing to do with the chupacabra or its signature form of vampiric predation. Or four, only mention dead livestock with no clear connection to the chupacabra at all. The chupacabra's first appearance in the United States was said to have been Miami, Florida on March 11, 1996, when it attacked some animals. Researcher Virgilio Sanchez Osejo of the Miami UFO Center took plaster casts of tracks left by the beast and compared them to those he had taken from the Chupacabra sightings in Calama, Chile. He concluded that the tracks belonged to an unknown, probably extraterrestrial, creature. It's all very mysterious and Chupacabra-like. But experts and scientists weren't so sure. In his book, The Island of Paradise, Jonathan Downs described, quote, a plaster cast of a footprint that had been given to me in Miami during February 1998 by a well-meaning UFO expert who claimed it had come from a Chupacabra. The problem was that neither the footprint nor the animal that the eyewitness who had originally procured the footprint claimed had made it had anything to do with the chupacabra. Whatever the footprint is, it's certainly not that of a chupacabra, end quote. Esteban Sarmiento, a primatologist and functional anatomist at the American Museum of Natural History, came to the same conclusion when he examined the tracks for a 2005 television documentary. He found clear evidence of hoaxing, concluding that the tracks were either sculpted or the animal that made the print was being held down and pushed into the dirt to make the cast. Whether Sanchez Osejo faked the Chupacabra track or was himself the victim of a prank is unclear, but either way, it seems hoaxing was afoot. (laughs) Olympia Govea of Sweetwater, Florida, claimed that 27 chickens and two goats had been killed by the Chupacabra. When professionals from the local zoo explained that her animals were likely killed by roving dogs, Govea ridiculed the experts, quote, If dogs were to blame, she challenged, why didn't they feast on the kill? And more importantly, what kind of dog leaves no blood at the scene of the carnage? End quote. Gofia's indignant response is typical of many people who believe the animals were killed by the goat sucker. She had suffered a scary shock, not to mention monetary loss, and felt she was being ignored and patronized by arrogant experts who dismissed her claims and discounted her experience. Govia's response is also typical in that she is simply mistaken about what canid predation looks like. Why didn't they feast on the kill, she demanded? Well, according to a a U.S. Fish and Wildlife report titled Procedures for Evaluating Predation on Livestock and Wildlife, quote, domestic dogs do not normally kill for food. As a rule, domestic dogs feed very little on their prey, end quote. Why was there little or no blood, she wanted to know? Well, since the animals were never taken for a professional necropsy, there's no reason to assume that the animals were in fact drained of blood. Furthermore, since the dogs merely killed their prey with a characteristic bite to the neck and did not try to eat the animals, we wouldn't expect to find a bloody scene anyway. Govea's unfamiliarity with the signs of canid predation essentially created a mystery where none existed. Once she incorrectly assumed that her animals had been visited by a vampire, she assumed the culprit was the chupacabra she'd heard about in newspapers, on radio, and in television. Though Puerto Rico and the rest of the world now had a name and a somewhat definitive description of the chupacabra, its origin was as puzzling as ever. Some believe the monster was left behind by visiting extraterrestrials. Others think it's the result of top-secret U.S. government experiments, Some, of a deeply religious bent, see the hand of Satan in the monster's work. 
What do some of the top chupacabra researchers think about the animal? Though up to now, there's been very little skeptical or scientific analysis of the beast, a handful of experts have researched the subject. Scott Corrales, who's written more on the subject than anyone else, refused several requests to be interviewed for this book. Carl Schuker seemed to be more reserved than Corrales about the likelihood of the chupacabra's existence, telling me, quote, I think it possible that there's some unusual animal at the basis of at least some reports, but nothing as remotely exotic as the press would like to make out, and quite possibly comprising a situation where a host of wholly different entities are all being lumped together to create what is essentially a non-existent composite. That is, the chupacabra as such is a created media monster made up of bits and pieces extracted from a welter of heterogeneous reports describing several totally unrelated animals, end quote. Is a chupacabra responsible for most or all of the deaths attributed to it? Nobody disputes that many pets, livestock, and other animals have been killed by other animals in Puerto Rico and elsewhere. Their carcasses stand as mute testimony to that reality. The real question is, what creature killed them? Something known and normal, such as a dog, coyote, or mongoose, or something unknown and possibly paranormal, such as a chupacabra? Center for Fordian Zoology researcher John Downs attributes at least some of the original Puerto Rican chupacabra reports to starving mongooses. He explains that, in the early 1990s, the island experienced an explosion in the rat population. As the rats became more common, the population of their chief predator, the mongoose, also jumped. After a while, having more mongooses solved the rat problem, but then created another issue. With few natural predators and a dwindling rat population upon which to feed, the animals began starving, becoming more aggressive and attacking animals they'd previously ignored, domestic creatures such as chickens, goats, and other livestock. As support for his theory, he states, quote, The fact is there hasn't been any more killings since 1998, ten years now. That would suggest that the explosion in the rat population was the case, and mongoose levels would return to normal again. Puerto Rican zoologist Edwin Velasquez researched chupacabra claims, concluding that the so-called mysterious killings were in fact attributable to dogs and mongooses. Another explanation is resist monkeys, which have lived on the island for over 30 years. It seems that the monkeys had been introduced to the island for research purposes, and some had escaped and begun their own colony. Some of them may have attacked livestock and house pets as well. I researched Puerto Rican zoology history and found no evidence of any unusual vampiric animals on the island, confirming that the chupacabra is indeed of recent vintage. An 1830 report by a British Army general named George Dawson Flinter described the island's generally favorable climate and lack of dangerous animals, except voracious rats. He said, quote, There are no venomous snakes or reptiles, no beasts of prey, no noxious bird or insects, end quote. So animal predation is not new. What is new and unusual, so chupacabra believers claim, is the element of vampirism, the hundreds of carcasses allegedly mysteriously drained of every drop of blood. Certainly there exist vampiric animals such as the vampire bats, leeches, lampreys, bedbugs, and mosquitoes. But none of these known vampires could be responsible for taking down even small rodents, much less goats and sheep. There must be something else at work. The chupacabra, unlike Bigfoot or the Loch Ness Monster, is, at its little black heart, a vampire. And to understand it, we must examine the vampire traditions from which the goat sucker is drawn. Chapter 2. A Brief History of Vampires In the West, when most people think of vampires, either historical, such as supposedly Romanian prince Vlad Sepish, or literary, such as creations by Bram Stoker, Anne Rice, and so on, the vampire they're familiar with has Slavic origins. Yet, as a cultural entity, vampires are worldwide phenomena. The ancient Greeks wrote of vampires, malevolent undead creatures that stalk the living, bringing death and disease. Humans could become vampires in several ways. For example, if a person led a sinful life, was buried in unconsecrated ground, or was excommunicated. The vampires most people are familiar with are revenants, a folkloric term meaning human corpses that are said to return from the grave to harm the living. Other, older versions of the vampire, from Greece, India, Egypt, and elsewhere, were not thought to be human at all, but instead supernatural, possibly demonic entities that were never human and therefore did not take human form when they stalked their prey. The chupacabra is just the sort of vampire. You've been listening to a chapter adapted from part one of my book, Tracking the Chupacabra, the Vampire Beast in Fact, Fiction, and Folklore 
published in March from the University of New Mexico Press. The rest of the book includes Part 1, The Short History of the Vampire, Chapter 1, The Goat Sucker Mystery, Part 2, Folklore of the Chupacabra, Chapter 2, A Brief History of Vampires, Chapter 3, Chupacabras and Pop Culture, Part 3, Search for the Chupacabra, Chapter 4, Searching for the Chupacabras in Nicaragua, Chapter 5, The Dead Vampires Speak, Chupacabra Carcasses, Chapter 6, The Curious Case of the Cuero Chupacabra, Part 4, Solving the Mystery of the Chupacabra, Chapter 7, Reconsidering the Goat Sucker, and Chapter 8, The Zoology of Chupacabras and the Science of Vampires. There are also three appendices, a comparison of 10 notable Chupacabra reports, 1995 to 2010, Appendix 2, How to Identify Chupacabra, and Appendix 3, a 2010 interview with Madeline Tolentino. For more on the Chupacabra, visit chupacabramystery.com or look for my book, Tracking the Chupacabra. This recording is copyright 2011 by Benjamin Radford. It may be redistributed free of charge for non-commercial purposes under a Creative Commons license as long as proper authorship attribution is given. Thanks for listening to this audio excerpt of Tracking the Chupacabra by Ben Radford. To get your own copy signed by the author, visit radfordbooks.com or buy the regular edition at amazon.com.